Our own Derek Young caught up with new K-State commit Dylan Edwards. Hear what he had to say next. You are listening to KC Sports Network, the number one podcast network for today's Kansas City sports fans. With former players from your favorite teams, informed perspectives, and former insiders, this is the place for you. You can find us wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube channel, all over social media, or our morning newsletter, KCSN Daily, dedicated to your Kansas City Chiefs. KC Sports Network is proudly presented by m Bank, your partner in Possible. Welcome into another Three Mob Podcast. I am John Kurtz, joined as always by Derek Young from K-State Online, as well as Cole Manbeck, former beat writer for the Manhattan Mercury. And uh, today, more football and basketball recruiting updates to get to you. I think all very exciting right now. K-State football is red hot, and that includes landing Dylan Edwards, who we talked about last time on an emergency pod. But today, you'll get a chance to hear from Dylan Edwards. Derek was in attendance at his commitment ceremony at Derby High School, and uh, you'll get to hear but a very confident future cat and uh, some of the work he may be doing on trying to bring some others with him. Plus basketball recruiting where K-State stands with some big time 2023 prospects. And we know about another grown, you know what, man, that K-State is bringing into the program this year. As always, we appreciate the help of Holiday Distillery and 360 Vodka. If you're celebrating something, if you're drowning your sorrows, whatever it may be, if you're a Royals fan trying to stagger through the Royal season this year, you're going to need plenty of 360 Vodka or their new bourbon from Holiday Distillery that is out as well. Either way, use it to help cope. Use it to get excited about the cats, whatever it is that you need. We appreciate the help of Holiday Distillery as always. Okay, so let me let you in on a little industry secret here, how the sausage is made. You saw how fast we got that pot out last time, right? This is where, you know, we need to take some time to brag about Derek here. You know, D.Y. knew this whole time what was happening with Dylan Edwards. We just can't straight up tell you that all the time. So we had the pod ready to go and shoot out there as soon as the commitment was made. We did not actually know how that commitment was going to go at the time. And our concern about putting that pod out was like, hey, what if Dylan does something crazy? What if it's the Gavin Potter taking off two t-shirts thing? And then we missed that and we're not talking about that. But Cole, to the surprise of Many, perhaps us, there were no theatrics at all from Dylan Edwards. It was pretty straightforward. Outside of maybe putting the Nebraska hat in the middle, that, that would be maybe the only thing that he like specifically wanted the Nebraska hat in the middle. But, uh, you know, he went for the K-State hat. There were nothing crazy. Nothing crazy happened there in his commitment. I, I fully expected him to mess with us a little bit, especially because all the crystal balls started coming into K-State over the prior 24 to 48 hours. Everyone presumed he was coming to Manhattan at that point. So I thought, you know, he'd like to keep a little mystery around it and, and mess with K-State fans, put on Nebraska or OU hat, throw it aside. Like we see so many kids do. And I'll just say, I, I really appreciate that he didn't do that. I mean, I just loved how he got it out of the way right away. It's, he might've been a little nervous, but he just threw on the K-State hat immediately, took all the drama out of it. And, uh, and I really appreciate that. Wouldn't it have been kind of awesome though, if, you know, he rips the, like just straight up, like, Hulk Hogan style, like rips the shirt off and it's, you know, goes from an Oklahoma shirt to like K-State painted on his chest. You wouldn't have, there would have been no appeal to that. I I don't want him doing anything similar to what Gavin Potter did. All right. So I I would prefer to stay away from anything like that. I mean, I would have been fine with him, you know, tossing an OU or Nebraska hat or throwing a Nebraska hat in the trash. That would have been cool with me, but uh, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do any painting on the chest anymore. I've seen enough of that just with Gavin Potter. I I, I think the uh, only, buzzworthy um, observation to really make from the ceremony itself was the excitement from Leon Edwards and how he's turned yeah. in, turned into a GIF just from, a, you know, what was the statement? If you want to play some real football, come to K-State. So uh, I think Leon's probably the one that probably generated the most conversation afterwards. He did. That was great, man. I was saying big Leon energy. I need some big Leon energy in my life. And, uh, that was very cool to see that. I, I appreciated uh, those. I think it was the K-State fan on Twitter. I apologize if I got his name wrong, but he, he tweeted out like some highlights of Leon Edwards from back in the day. Uh, that was a nice touch as well to, to connect all that together on one shining moment of a day for K-State fans. And uh, sounds like there may be another one coming July 5th when uh, Avery Johnson makes his decision as well. But 
I mentioned D.Y. got a chance to catch up with Dylan Edwards. This is a very confident kid, especially for his age right now. So here, we'll give you a chance to hear from Dylan Edwards what he thinks about the commitment to K-State and perhaps most importantly at this point, what it is that he's trying to do to make this class even better. Derek Young with the Three Mall Podcast as part of the Kansas City Sports Network. We're at Dylan Edwards' commitment ceremony where he just picked Kansas State. Um, as always, thanks to our partners uh, with the 360 Vodka, but we're here with Dylan Edwards now. Dylan, what are your emotions at this point and having it behind you? Ball game. That's all I got to say. Um, I mean, it, it's been a long time coming, but I knew what was home when I first stepped on campus. And I had the best recruiting, you know, I could have. You know, experience I could have, and I'm, I'm glad to be home. Now, you did commit to the staff before today. It was on your official visit, of course, yeah. when you were there with Coach Kleiman. But when did you actually know that it was going to be K-State? Has it been that way for a long time? Um, I mean, I was, you know, crystal ball to Oklahoma. And, uh, I mean, I, they had a really good staff and had a really good time at those visits. But the reason I didn't commit is because I knew it was home. You know, I, I could become myself and... Do, do everything I want to do at K-State and stay home. So that's what I'm doing. You did enjoy your process quite a bit. Is there any, like, one, two, three moments that really stick out that happened between you and the Wildcats that made you feel at home? I mean, they were here all the time. I mean, I didn't get one day where I didn't get a phone call saying they were coming to my weight room to watch me lift or anything. So just stuff like that. I mean, you can't, you can't pass up. If they really want you, they're going to show it, and they did. You and your dad have been very, I guess you could call it email today, talking about building, you know, a great class, trying to add other guys to the picture. Just how successful do you think it'll be in doing so? I think I'd be very successful in that. I mean, building my brand, building my, you know, I'm, I'm going to be what I want to be in Manhattan, and that's what I'm going to do. Is there a top recruiting pitch that really resonated with you? No. There was nothing that, nothing. I mean, I knew what was home, and that's what I, That's why I made the decision today. Uh, obviously, you kind of prioritized Avery Johnson already in your first statements after you committed. Uh, just how uh, much is that going to be a part of your process moving forward? He's coming. I'm going to try to get him here, and if he doesn't come here, <laughs> I know where his house is. I'm going to go get him. So I'm joking, but, yeah, I want him. I want him to be my quarterback. We're going to run it back just like the old days. What are some of your best relationships on the staff? Spad Brett, Coach B, B.A., Coach C.K., Coach Kleiman, Coach Malone. I created relationships with all those guys. Coach Riley. I mean, I created relationships with the whole staff. It wasn't just one, one person I committed to. I committed to the school also. I love the campus of K-State. I love Aggieville. I love everything about it, so I can't wait. What's, what's B.A. like? How would you describe him to the average fan that may not get to be around him the way that you do? About the staff? Brian Anderson, Coach Anderson. Oh, we, you know, rolled in Manhattan, drop top, and a Mercedes Benz the whole weekend. So I had a lot of fun with Coach. And, I mean, he, he came here and he really poured into me and wanted me to, you know, be great at K State, and that's what I'm going to do. Coach Kleiman, just what are the conversations with him like? That's the head coach. Uh, but, uh, you know, what, how would you describe him to fans that don't get to be around him the way that you do? More chill guy. He, he wants he wants K-State to be great. And I don't think he just wants to go to a bowl game. That's not in his mind. He wants to go to the national championship. And, I mean, whatever it takes to get there, that's what he'll do. But, yeah, that's, that's, that's what he is. How would you characterize the evolution of the offense under Colin Klein? He's the new offensive coordinator. We know that that's made a large impact on Avery. How much of an impact did it make on you? Yeah, that LSU game, you knew. I mean, he was that guy at, you know, OC. I think he's been waiting for it for a while. And that he has the reins, um, we're going to be winning a lot of games. And we're going to be scoring a lot of points. And that's what I can't wait to see. Was there anything that stood out about it when you saw it in the spring ball? Because I'm sure it was probably even more evolved at that point. Yes, when I went to the practice, it was much much so, you know, saying everything. And he broke everything down. You know, they're, you know, protecting Deuce. So, I mean, um, they didn't have a spring game, but make sure we will, hopefully. Yeah. Your dad uh, is pretty, you know, emotional and all over the place right now. Is he that way always, or is today just a little bit special for him? It's a little bit special. Um, from the beginning, I think my dad wanted me to go here. So, um, well, what was his response, his reaction when you told him that you were going? Oh, him and Coach Kleiman started, you know, sharing. Oh, he found out at the same time. Yeah. 
So they, I did not tell nobody until that day. So. And how'd you go about telling the other programs? Was that soon after? Yeah, it was definitely soon after. I called um, each coach that I was interested in, and they understood. Um, they told me I didn't sign a piece of paper till December, but I'm locked in. Are, th- are those conversations hard? Just because I never really asked a prospect about that when you have to tell a coach, hey, I'm, I'm not going to where you – because you probably – you've talked to them every day too. I mean, they understood. I mean, they knew. I mean, right when I went to the official to Manhattan, they were like, well, they knew what they – you know, K-State was going to do on my official. I got them there, and they understood. There was no bad blood or anything. I had great relationships, and they told me I was going to keep the same relationship to this day. The Inner Armour All-American game, is, is that something you're really excited about as well? Yeah, first K-State guy in Under Armour All-American game, that's history. Yeah. And I'm making history already, not even at K-State yet. Okay, and then uh, who else? You, you spoke about Avery Johnson. Who else? Is there anyone else on your radar? I want to flip Jaden Doss. Okay. I want to get <laughs> Joe Audi. I want to get Jaden. Doss, like I said, I want to get a whole bunch of other recruits. I just think Josh, Josh Manning. Manning, I think we can get a whole bunch of recruits and we can have fun while doing it. I mean, we're all good friends and we know each other, so it's, it's going to be a great thing. Have you been communicating with them already? Yeah. Yeah, we already got it planned out. I hope, you know, Avery and Josh pull the trigger very, very soon because it's going to be something special. All That's right. class in K-State history. All right, you heard him. That's a good, good note to close on. That's Dylan Edwards, the newest Kansas State commit. All right, so there's Dylan Edwards. Appreciate him taking some time with Derek uh, to chat right after his commitment at the ceremony at Derby High School. I I think the thing that will be of most note to fans there is hearing him talk about, like, trying to work on some others here in this class. And I know one of the easy places to go with that would be like, hey, can you get Joe Otting to back out of that Notre Dame commitment, which is probably going to be very difficult, but that is the immediate one that jumps to my mind. Like, hey, let's flip this whole thing. Let's get all these top guys in the state. Um where do you feel like things stand with Dylan Edwards trying to to work on on kids right now? He's done some of it publicly, but I would imagine there's more of that going on behind the scenes. Yeah, and, and Joe Otting, he's done publicly, and he was one of the four players he mentioned to me, as as the, the listeners just heard. And so was Nebraska commit Jaden Doss and then Avery Johnson and Joshua Manning. I think Johnson and Manning were probably clearly the obvious ones. Uh, flipping Doss from Nebraska or Otting from Notre Dame is probably – um, very improbable at this point, uh, especially Doss. I don't, I don't know that that needle is going to be moved, and they they may have, you know, been leaning towards different wide receivers now anyway. Between you know Joshua Manning and then the Jacoby Lanier from Arizona, and how that's kind of surged to the surface all of a sudden as well. Um, but Odding, I mean, that's the dream school. Um, I mean, Kansas State gave it a fight. I just. I, might be more likely than DOS, but that doesn't mean it's likely at all. And I would give that, you know, probably still a less than one percent chance. Uh, I just, I just don't see it happening. But Edwards is a well-known figure. We we've spoke about this before. Um, he's well known on recruiting circles. He knows a lot of good prospects, and he'll ha- he'll have an impact one way or another. Um, even if it's not with Joe Otting. I mean, it's probably already happening with Avery, I imagine. Um, good players want to play with good players, but a- Avery was probably leaning towards Kansas State and and coming to Kansas State regardless of what Dylan chose to do. So um, it'll be interesting if there's uh, a, a prospect that he's directly responsible for. But right now I'm struggling to come up with one, but just him being the cheerleader and putting Kansas State in front of everyone's faces is good enough. Well, what about Manning? I mean, how, how likely is it that Manning's going to wind up coming here? That I mean, I think that's probably – I won't say if Avery Johnson commits to Kansas State that it's automatic that Manning does, but you're probably not going to get him without Avery Johnson. So that's the way I would phrase it. So there's a little bit of a – it's probably – your chances with him are contingent upon what Avery decides to do. I think, And just in general, I think receivers like to know who their quarterback is going to be, not necessarily the specific one, but at least one that is – you know, that they know has some chops. Well, and Avery Johnson is going to decide on July 5th. We now know that. So you have at least a, a timeline there for the commitment date. He's, as we speak, recording this on Wednesday. He is at the Elite 11 camp going on right now with the twenty one of the 20 quarterbacks that was invited there. Uh, so I, I don't think it's surprising to see that the date wound up being July 5th officially. If you've been listening here on the pod, if you've been following KSO, 
It's really where Derek has been leading you for a long time, that that was likely what was going to happen. So it will require some patience, um, but circle that one on your calendars because that could be really fun. I guess I, I would just open it up to thoughts here on, one, Avery committing at Elite 11, or, or competing, rather, at Elite 11, and then, two, setting that commitment date for July 5th and, and where K-State stands. Yeah, I mean, we're less than a week away from his decision. I still feel very confident it'll be K-State. The, the, there's a chance that there's not a whole lot of drama to it. Um, it'll depend on other announcements, but Oregon is viewed as the overwhelming favorite for Dante Moore at this point. And Washington just host, hosted uh, Lincoln Kineholz, who had a Kansas State offer um, on the last official visit uh, weekend until September. So it'll be interesting if those two close on those before Avery decides. It might it might be uh, just uh, a foregone conclusion, which it, it probably already is to to some degree. Uh, I know I, I think I saw the Elite 11's uh, social media accounts put out on – was it Tuesday night? Because we're recording this on Wednesday, that I think Avery was in seventh after day one. So um, tracking to be in the Elite Eleven, there's 20 participants, I believe. So, and everyone's why why is there 20 participants in Elite Eleven? I mean, it's the final, so it's to determine who the Elite Eleven are. So I mean, Avery's in that top 11 right now. So um, that's a good start for him. Um, I hate to even bring it up, but the Iowa State quarterback command is number one after day one. JJ Cole. Oh, well, great. We can start another uh, overrated Iowa State quarterback through a career for the next four years. That'd be awesome. I saw that, uh, you know, Brock Purdy got the big, what, the Big 12 Sportsmanship Award? Yeah. He's, so, you he's, know, he's, maybe he'll be the next. What a legacy. What a legacy to leave if you are Brock Purdy. You won the Big 12 Sportsmanship Award. How could you pot? And it's so in line. Iowa State, they care. They don't care about winning championships. They care about sportsmanship and everything. We heard that from Matt Campbell. So, I mean, it seems like this kid – is destined to be number one on the sportsmanship list. So congratulations to him. Uh, that would be my sincere thoughts to offer to what's his name, whoever J- he is. JJ Cool. Yep. He's a yeah. he's a six foot six, two hundred thirty pound quarterback, John. And uh, maybe Iowa State will hang it next to that banner of most together team in America. That if uh, yeah, there, that's what it was. Yes, yeah. that's what it was. It'll be flying that flag at uh, Jack Tri Stadium this next season. So hey, uh, you know, on the Avery Johnson recruitment, obviously Dy has alluded to the fact that K-State's been the front runner for a while. If you guys have been listening to this pod and, you know, he kind of gave it away, you know, now you got to take media interviews with a grain of salt. These kids sometimes can mess with you. I don't think Avery Johnson's doing this, but in a story from 24 seven sports at the elite 11 that was published last night, he was asked about his top three finalists in K-State, Washington and Oregon and about his recruitment overall and what he was looking for. And, I quote, Avery Johnson said, a lot of people tell you go where you're wanted the most. That was big to me with this process. He then is asked about the top three schools and his his finalists. And regarding Kansas State, I really love the coaching staff, Coach Klein, Coach Ward. I can go down the list. I enjoyed being around them close to home. They wanted me the most out of the three schools. So if you connect the dots to where he says what was really big to him is go where you're wanted the most. And then he acknowledges that Kansas State wanted him the most. You can kind of jump to the conclusion there that it's likely Kansas State's going to be the choice, which DY has said all along. But, uh, you know, take some hints there, K State fans. There could be a lot of positive news coming in, in less than a week. Uh, so it, it would be a huge get, obviously. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that says it kind of right there. Like you said, that he's just pointing out that Kansas State was basically the school that matched all of, of his criteria. And then, you know, connect another dot that he showed up to Dylan Edwards' commitment ceremony. Yeah, that obviously, I think, means something. I'm sure he yeah. was pretty aware of what the, the commitment was going to be. And they and they both went to the Catbacker event in Wichita, which I thought was probably the most powerful thing. I mean, that's not the most entertaining thing to go to if you're 16, 17 years old. So. No, no, it's not. No, it, it is it is not. Uh, very valid point there. So yes, all, all signs good on that front. And then, I mean, hearing you say that Josh Manning may soon follow after an Avery Johnson commitment, that that is awesome to hear too. Like as many dominoes seem to be falling right now, there there could be more and better dominoes that start to fall in place after that. I mean, look at, I know this is on a much grander scale, but look at what's happened with Texas and Arch Manning. I mean, Arch Manning commits and then it seems like every day I hop on Twitter and I see people uh, to the point where they're making jokes. I saw Josh Pate making a joke 
the other day about like just every time he logs on Twitter, there's a new Texas commitment that everybody is following and wanting to play with Arch Manning. So there would figure to be at least somewhat of that effect with with Avery Johnson, I would think. I would I would anticipate that to some degree. Um, but, but that'll be a big week in general because uh, we, we said Avery makes his announcement on July 5th, but running back Joe Jackson will make his announcement the day before on July 4th. And then Donovan McIntosh, the uh, very long corner from St. Louis that they really, really like as well, and just had it on an official visit. Uh, he makes his decision that'll be Friday, July 1st. So the first week of July is already having some – it could, could be jam-packed. And they just picked up two commitments already, uh, but that would have been on Tuesday. Yeah, before we get into that, D.Y. and Cole – Question of the day here. Who has the better career, Arch Manning or Avery Johnson? Uh, Arch Manning. I more will more big world championship game appearances, Avery Johnson or Arch Manning? Big, uh, Avery. I, I don't know because I think Arch is, might sit one year because I don't think that that family would take that as a slight. I think that's one – prospect where you can say hey you're going to sit a year even if he probably doesn't need to and he's like okay you know but i mean i mean i guess i just you just put everyone in the manning family in the same box well if you're saying big 12 championships john they're leaving and after the 2024 season you're, right yeah right. so i'm going to take the easy one out championships conference championships. <laughs> that's what that's well, yeah that, that's why i i would pick avery for that because I, I think texas is tech actually going to leave after the 2023 season that's my guess well, uh, yeah, I, conference championships, Texas isn't winning the SEC, right? So they're never going to win an SEC title um, or a Big 12 title with uh, with Arch Manning, in my opinion. So I'll take Avery there. I mean, better career in terms of NFL, I'd probably take Arch Manning just because of the pedigree. But yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> it feels like a Manning is not going to be a bust, right? He's going to live up to that. I don't know, man. That's like, uh, that. that is, uh, I'm trying to, you know, they always say like, unstoppable force immovable object whatever i mean it's like the mannings are like an unstoppable force texas football being mediocre is an immovable object so when I mean, they meet like what yeah, what no, actually but, happens there but old miss wasn't great and eli was still good you could do both okay congratulations texas you're now old miss congratulations <laughs> on that headed into the sec you are old miss something to be proud of uh, it, the it, I mean, I, I have called Oklahoma, I think, basically Tennessee or Auburn and when they go to the SEC because I think they're just like fifth or sixth on the rung at that point. Which would definitely make Texas Ole Miss. It absolutely would. You know, and hey, Texas basically has Diet Lane Kiffin as their head coach. So that, that all works out. You know, a lesser guy who went through the, the Alabama rehabilitation program. So congratulations. And the, pa- and the Pac-12 rehabilitation. And, and yeah. got, you got muddied in the Pac-12. Yeah. Yeah. It's all perfect. It's all perfect. Okay. Let's talk about the commits because I know Cole's really excited to talk about these uh, commits that K-State has gotten over the last couple of days. Uh, we'll we'll start with – oh, I forgot to write down how to pronounce his name, Derek. You're going to have to help me out here. Kenigel. Kenigel Thomas. Kenigel Thomas. All right. Kenigel Thomas Don't is a three-star – three-star corner from Oklahoma. He had offers from Kansas, Iowa State, Oklahoma State, Texas Tech. And uh, K-State winds up getting a commitment from him. I mean, look, these are the types, we've said it before, but these are the types of recruitments we would be ecstatic about and really excited about in years past in in Chris Kleiman's classes. Now they're treated as more of an afterthought because you have the Dylan Edwards, Josh Mannings, Avery Johnsons of the world to uh, to pay attention to and and think about it are actually landing them. But, man, I mean, right. you, just, you just start to put together the list of school. This is what stands out to me about it. It's just another win over some of your regional rival schools here. And, I mean, if we're, if we're talking about Texas Tech, that's a school that's been recruiting as hot as anybody. They've been spending time in the top five nationally right now with how they're landing kids. So I, I don't take it lightly that, that K-State's able to go grab them. Yeah, well, it's Oklahoma State, Iowa State, Texas Tech, and Kansas. I know KU was on them up to the point that he committed. I'm not sure about the others. Uh, okay. Just just could have been a case too where, you know, June is a big month for commitments. They could have just filled up with guys that they had equal on their board, not necessarily that they, they didn't want them. So I, this is a guy that I can't fault them for taking. They also saw him up close in person. Um, he was at camp last Sunday night and was, he was really good. Um, they, they couldn't complete a ball on him. Uh, and, he could really run. That's a fat. That's a fast dude. He's got the track times. I, I tell you what, 
the comparison for me that kind of at least jumps out to me right away is a guy that hasn't played any football yet for Kansas State, but they they also think is going to be really special and just had a great track season. That's Jacob Parrish um, from Olathe North. And, and the, the, you know, the term multi-year starter is already thrown, or, thrown around about Jacob Parrish. That's how much they like him. And I think Nigel Thomas is basically in that same vein. I mean, he's a very, very similar athlete. He isn't, you know, the big, tall, long 6'2", six, 6'3", six, corner. Um, like some of the guys they have on the roster, like Julius Brent, so like like they may land on Friday, and Donovan McIntosh, but he's, you know, kind of in between. He's similar to Echo, a little just an inch shorter, so he's not like completely small. But that's why he kind of makes me think of Jacob Parrish because Jacob Parrish is built similarly. I hate that word. Can't I think those it. are great. I think those are great comps. The I like the echo comparison as well. When you look at the size and the speed factor, I think he ran a 21.8, 200 meter in track, which is elite speed. Jacob Parrish was a little faster than that. I think Parrish was at 21.6. So, I mean, you're getting track type speed here. These guys can really run and get after it. And, and he was a camp offer, right? So how do you feel if you're KU and you've been recruiting him for months and then Kansas State offers just a couple days ago at their camp and he immediately commits. I mean, it speaks yeah, volumes, I, right? That, that, I had that comment said to me about that too. It was like, man, KU, that has to sting because they've been investing time and time and time into this kid and, you know, maybe outlast everyone in case they get to on camp, offer them. And kind of what it was explained to me is like it took him 10 seconds to commit. He basically, because he was offered during the camp, like he, he was in the middle of taking reps. They pull him aside. Chris Kleiman offers him. And I think he was, he committed to K State before he got back in line. That's, that's the way it was told to me. Awesome. Well, you love that, man. I, I tell you what, though, I was, I was reading this is a shout out to the, the KSO boards. You know, somebody brought to my attention a, a thread on fog.net. You know, one of the outstanding uh, Kansas internet fan sites where they were discussing how they're just getting their rear ends kicked in state and by K State in general, recruiting wise, DY. But what I heard is once they win a few games, then it, it will, the brand of Kansas will carry over and, you know, everything's going to be fine there at that point, even though they're about to go 0 for the top 15 in state. So, yeah. Well, I, know you- that, I know this isn't in state, but, you know, I'm right. just telling you the Kansas, I'm, listen, we're K State guys, we're homers. When you present the other side, this is not going to be an echo chamber. Kansas is coming, and Lance Leipold is clearly displaying the recruiting prowess that, uh, you know, helped him recruit so much talent to Buffalo, New York. So I'm I'm just saying maybe we shouldn't be uh, celebrating as much as we are right now. Um, I, I guess I'll say this. I'm a little stunned and maybe impressed to an extent that a fan base can be so optimistic still after, like, 10 to 12, I mean, maybe, or no, let's say 15 of the worst like years of like a power five or, or some of the worst years of a power five program ever where you're winning two games at most and most often zero one, you get your ass kicked every week and you still have optimistic that are optimistic about a coach that has never won a conference cha- championship. Well, you well, got not ESPN. Only that, not only that, optimistic about the brand still after all that and optimistic about landing in the big 10, like one of the two premier conferences now. I mean, you, you tell, I tell you what, man, they're, they got optimism coming out. They're, their ass. they're dedicated. Like it's, it's crazy. They're, yeah. They're dedicated to the, uh, whatever it is that they're doing because I, I couldn't do it. Sorry, Cole, I cut you off. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, you got ESPN writing ridiculous articles about emulating Bill oh, Snyder Bill and what he did. I mean, come on. Yeah, well, you can't even mention Bill Snyder's name in the same breath as Lance Leipold. That's a ridiculous comp at what Lance Leipold's, Leipold's accomplished so far. And and I saw they were trying to defend that it was, didn't write the headlines, but it also makes the comparison in the actual article. I mean, the, the people have to pump the brakes here. Well, I, I like Bill Connolly a lot, and he is somebody like he, he does respect K-State. He respects the Big 12. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the reason that article got written. He's a Mizzou guy. And so he, I remember talking to him when last summer, when Texas and Oklahoma left, and he had a lot of empathy, sympathy uh, for the Big 12 schools because he, that's what he grew up with. He, he has a really good knowledge of even like, you know, I've talked to him about like 1998 K State, Missouri before. Like, so I respect him a lot. But yeah, the premise of the article, like, I saw some KSU fans said, like, hey, maybe like Dan McCartney, like start out with like a Dan McCartney comparison, something like that. That, that would be much better. I think the big picture here is like 
people are just so excited that Kansas has somebody who's not a total boob as their coach. Like yeah, low just, bar. <laughs> yes. Like somebody who is a competent football coach that he has been elevated so much that it's crazy. And I, I do think that there's an overcorrection on Kansas right now. Another thing I saw the other day, Cole, I saw someone talking about like sleeper tier one quarterbacks in college football. And they mentioned Daniels, Jaden Daniels at Kansas. Um, Jalen, uh, is it Jalen Daniels? Yeah, I, yeah J- hey, Jalen Daniels. This. I'm sorry. Yes, Jalen Daniels. And no, I mean, look again. Yeah. After dreadful quarterback play for like two decades, I understand why he looks that much better. But like, really, we're going to talk about him with the potential to be a tier one quarterback this year? You I just the there's shirt. such an overcorrection on Kansas right now. I think they're getting ahead of themselves. Yeah, I mean, tier one's jumping the shark. For sure. He flashed, but that's really jumping the shark. I mean, I would say tier one, but those are like NFL draft guys that you would think, right? That's how I would view it. Um, I don't think we know enough about him. Cole, you're not a big Jalen Daniels fan? I, I just say it's small sample size from what we saw at the end of last year when he really turned it on. So, um, like, I still have memories of him throwing a uh, pass Justin directly Gardner. to Justin Gardner. That was the worst so, pass I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yeah so I think – Look, I know he was like I, – I know he's a really young kid, right? He was like 18 in yeah, that game, no. right? <laughs> that so was I, bad. I, but uh, I, I just – Unless Miles was a coach. Yeah, that, that's all true. So, look, I, I think he can be a, a good quarterback. But this all gets back to what you said, John. The fact that they just simply now have a competent head coach, the overreaction to that is, oh, Kansas can become an 8-9 win team eventually here. Leipold's really going to get it going. To me, getting it going at Kansas will be four wins to a maximum of six wins, maybe by year three or four. You know, Maybe he gets them to bowl eligibility. I, I don't even know if he can do that. They're, they're not recruiting – well enough and his personality doesn't really strike me as someone that's going to recruit all that well but you know his assistants may be better recruiters runs a better program has him more prepared but i don't know i think he's a worse recruiter than david Beatty and charlie weiss or charlie not charlie weiss david Beatty and les miles charlie weiss and les miles became like the same person to me over time yeah (laughs) i can i can see why yeah all right well um it was fun to talk a little like more actual football we're, we're kind of getting there here in the Almost. summer i had to shoehorn some of that in here into the recruiting talk so i hope everyone uh, doesn't mind but we're going to take a break when we come back we'll get into a uh, basketball recruiting case state does now we know another member of the squad now that's a transfer we also are waiting on a uh, another because we got to bring on the cats announcement uh yesterday from jerome tang and where does k-state sit with uh laden blocker day day ames a couple of high high prospect hope high profile rather prospects in the 2023 class we'll get to all that coming up next All right, we are back. Now we dive into basketball on the Three Ma podcast. Uh, K-State has lost out on one kid basketball recruiting-wise. We'll start with the bad news and then get into some of the good news here and what is going on. Layden Blocker uh, committed to Arkansas. That was another one that I think if you've been paying attention, um, he's a 2023 kid, four-star recruit. Um, K-State, Kansas, and Arkansas, I I guess you could consider the finalist there. Uh, Derek, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but – um Arkansas seemed to be the pick for a while unfortunately even though K-State got a visit and was in there with him uh he is going to be a Razorback and Arkansas is just frankly recruiting very well right now and and they have things really up and running yeah I mean I think Arkansas is gonna be number one or number two preseason in the country for this upcoming basketball season so they're loaded they're gonna stay loaded Eric Musselman he, he knows what he's doing I think he's got a lot of resources at his disposal and they got the win and that's in recruiting I don't know, maybe besides like Duke and Kentucky, of course, I don't know that there's a team tougher to be on the recruiting trail right now than Arkansas. Um, they get just about everyone that they want. Uh, high school and transfer portal. I think they got a humming. That NIL money sure helps that they got at their disposal. Yeah, so. I'm sure. I mean, and it, well, I, mean, I guess I'll, I'll put this in a Kansas State centric thing still. Um, I, I do think that and they they had Day Day Ames also on a official visit, the four star guard out of Chicago. Uh, you know, still don't hear a lot of other schools associated with him either. So I, I still have, you know, a guarded confidence level that um, that'll go their way. Yeah, I mean, I, do we have a any expectation for when a decision is coming from Ames? 
No, I, th- I think Cole said he was in Cabo. Are you just stalking out his Instagram. That's right. <laughs> hey, hey, Cole is Cole is a complete sleuth when it comes to Instagram accounts of players. A guy who doesn't even use Instagram for himself. You know, I mean, I got a Snapchat Cole to ever get a hold of him, but he's on Instagram all the time looking at these kids. And so, yeah, he gave us the update that uh, Day Day Ames was in Cabo, so probably not making a commitment. Uh, I uh, look. I've become kind of that. Uh, I, I didn't even. I never was on Instagram. Paparazzi. I was never on Instagram until Jerome Tang and staff came in. And then now I'm out there stalking. I look, I'll just be transparent. All right. I look at the, uh, I look at the coaches followers every day. And if I see a number added to their follower account, I then track and look through to see who knew they followed. Hey, I tried texted you guys, Desi Sills on a Friday night at 11 o'clock that you are Mal- at Malagy followed Desi Sills. All right. And then Desi Sills committed three days later. All right. So that's how we knew they were on him. I, I just always think, I think of the, uh, you know, that meme that goes around where it's like a, a husband and wife or, you know, boyfriend, girlfriend, like laying in bed. And the girl's like laid over on one side. And there's like a little bubble there that's like, he's probably on Instagram looking at half naked girls. And then like the other side will be Cole rolled over like on his phone. And it's just like, oh man, look at who Maliki just followed. <laughs> that is that is exactly how I picture this going right now. That is, that is totally me. I mean, you guys got a text from me late last night about another recent follow that occurred, probably at like 1130 last night. I'm sitting there watching the Elizabeth Holmes documentary on Netflix. My wife got me hooked on, which I never even watch Netflix usually either. And I'm sitting there and I see this follow and I text you guys. And, you know, I, this is my this is my life now. I mean, I, I it's my new hobby. It's my new hobby. Yeah, my wife, she sees me instead of looking at girls on Instagram, she sees me looking at where 18 year old kids are visiting <laughs> in Cabo. Right. So it's a real great look for me. There is a, I know it kind of already broke, but now it's official kind of just wanted to bark in here. Big 12 has hired their new commissioner and Brett Yormark. There we go. Oh man. I love this. The rock I, nation executive. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, I guess shameless plug here. You can watch my personal YouTube channel. I'll have more on this uh, come up tonight, but yeah, man, the fact that they're taking a guy from, Rock Nation, outside of the traditional college athletics world. There's a K-State tie-in here because Gene Taylor had publicly said at the Catbacker event and just things that I, you know, I think we all had kind of heard behind the scenes with that like K-State was thinking, hey, go get somebody with college athletic experience because I would guess they're not looking too fondly on George Klievkov of the Pac-12, who was hired from the MGM Grand in Vegas outside of the college athletics world. Kevin Warren was, was a practicing lawyer um attorney when they hired him so they kind of went outside the box there but like man we are not in the same college athletics world that anybody who's had a career in it has experienced like it's Mm -hmm. time for new ideas and something new and fresh and exciting and everything i read about this guy is that he's an ass kicker and is is great and has worked with you know more like entertainment industry stuff i don't know i just yeah he knows how to make an entertaining product and uh, I think if he can connect with TV execs, like I, just, I love it. And how about the the Big Twelve doing something progressive and cool? Both yep. of those being accomplished at the same time with this. They, Rock Nation, Jay Z's record label, right? So that's why you're seeing all the Jay Z. Hey, I got 99 problems. A commission ain't one. All that stuff. Um, it's a cool, exciting new move. I'm, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Yeah, he seems to be about innovation. And like you said, I don't know. I don't know why you would value college experience, you know, anymore in this landscape. Because then you're college, just going to be dragging things back behind. Yeah, like, co- you know, college, ath- really college athletics today is not college athletics even three years ago. So college experience doesn't really help you a ton. Maybe it does when negotiating a television deal. I can, I can see where it maybe comes into play there. And I think that was probably Kansas State's angle and on their preference. But uh, aside from that, I just don't know how valuable college experience really is anymore. This guy's been on the brink of innovation and many of the things that he's done, you know, whether it's managing NASCAR, the Brooklyn Nets, um, Rock Nation. And with Rock Nation, you know, they just they had to go through, you know, I did some research. They had to go through this, you know, phase where during COVID, just like everyone else and wondering how they get their artists in front of people and how to you know still make a profit still bring in revenue and they had to be innovative with new media to do that right because you couldn't do it in person and i think that's kind of you know the right 
traffic lane for the commissioner spot in the Big 12 at this point because you're going to have to be innovation with new forms of revenue and new media. Agreed. Yeah. You yeah. got to listen to some Jay Z now. Now, Cole, can we get you? You got Wale. Can we get you to listen to some Jay Z? I think I know a little Jay Z. I can't name the songs off the top of my head, but uh, I think I'd know it if it came on. So, uh, is it New York State of Mind? Is that is it Jay Z? It, it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, See, but... look at me. Uh, look, innovative, outside the box hire. Really like it. Uh, I think to what Dy said. I think K-State was a little concerned about having someone with negotiating TV deals experience background in that. But I think I think your mark will take it, the Big 12 toward a streaming environment. Potentially, I, I think he's innovative enough that they'll think of something. And I feel very confident that he'll take them down the right road with this. I think it's a great hire. OK, this is the part that I've been dreading, because as we get back into basketball here to close things down, this is a tough name for me to pronounce. All right. Another very tough name. The Good basketball team, you're going to have to get out that pronunciation guide. It's going to put Tom Gilbert to work making that pronunciation guide this year. But uh, K-State did get a rebounding machine uh, that we know about. Abayame Aiola. Abayame Aiola. Uh, but yeah, Abayami. I'll go Abayami Aiola. Hey, whatever it is. Great you know, guy that can really protect the rim, play some defense, a rebounding machine. Um, his best games are against the best teams on the schedule, especially this last year when he was playing for, uh, oh, that escapes me, Hofstra. Uh, the, the, he had 18 and 14 against Arkansas, if I remember, an Elite Eight team. He had 11 rebounds against Houston, if I remember correctly, an Elite Eight team. So um, I think Cole even mentioned to us when he was, I think it was when he was still at Stetson in year two. He had like a double figure scoring game against Duke, I want to say. So uh, this guy just really shows up when the the, light, the lights are brightest as well. And it's a good fit. I like that they took him as the second center rather than Alex Chaku from Alabama because I think Alex Chaku is kind of uh, repetitive to Jarrell Colbert. I think you're looking at two project, project bigs that maybe needed some time in the oven to bake and to develop a little bit um, at Kansas State if you had both now – Jarrell Colbert, he can still develop, but they got a guy that can really come in and contribute, and he's a grown-ass man that can play right away and has proven production at the uh, Division One level. Yeah, he's, he's 24 years old. He's going to turn 25 uh, during the season, actually. So as we talk about, he is a grown-ass man that's been through it, and he is a rebounding machine. Uh, this is a perfect addition for K-State, whether he comes off the bench or if he starts over Jarrell Colbert. I, he's a guy with great experience, you know, you look at some of his numbers, he's been a top 100 rebounder on the offensive and defensive side of the floor and the advanced analytic metrics across the country. So you get a top 100 rebounder. Last year, he had an offensive rebounding percentage of 17.3%. That was the third best O rebounding percentage in the entire country. You know, he's averaged over seven rebounds a game throughout most of his career. Um, DY mentioned some of the big numbers that he put up. In big games, 18 and 14 against Arkansas, he had 11 rebounds against a very good Houston team. You look at the game against Duke where he had 19 points. He had high efficiency performances in that game. In fact, if you look at his offensive ratings in that game, anything over 100 is good. He had 120-0 rating against Houston, 122-0 rating against Arkansas, and 119-0 rating against Duke in 2019. So he has performed well on the big stage against big-time opponents. And if you look at his offensive rating last year, he had a 134 offensive rating, which tied for fifth best in the entire country. So a very efficient player um, that has he shot over 52% in his career. He's a 72% per year free throw shooter. Uh, in fact, speaking of Instagram, I saw on his Instagram story, he's out there popping threes today, working out, draining threes. I mean, this is a guy that's got a nice looking shot too. He'll play around the basket, and he's going to get after it on the boards. And mm -hmm. that's something I think this this K-State team is going to rebound the heck out of the basketball when you look at the roster that they built. Yeah. was the free throw percentage for big? It's like in the 70s, right? He, yeah, 72. Yeah. yeah, it's real good. Stroke it. So, I mean, the, the roster as a whole, long, athletic, would Deep. seem to be defense and rebounding, which – if you are trying to just break in in that first year, I mean, we've talked so much about Iowa State and what they were able to do. I mean, their path was basically be a team that can defend, rebound, and not score a whole lot. And it 
was able to get them a high enough finish to make the NCAA tournament in the league. And then once they got in the tournament, they got a really nice break and, and set up a sweet 16 run. So I'm, not I'm a terrible still, strategy if you're trying to just, you know, milk yeah. whatever you can out of next year before you can really get more skill in, in your program offensively. Yeah, and they're going to be really deep to a much better bench than they had a season ago. Um, I'm stealing this from someone because they asked me this too. Remember this time last year, what you thought of Iowa State? Just try to remember what your actual thoughts were on the Iowa State roster at, at this day last year. And now think about the one that Kansas State has now. Which one would you take? And technically, you'd probably take Kansas State because I don't think anyone knew this time last year that Iowa State's roster would be able to produce what they what they ultimately did. Now, do they have someone who turns into a total stud like Iowa State did? I mean, that'll be the question. But they're they're giving themselves plenty of lottery tickets, you know, for that to be the case. Well, are we up to ten scholarship players now? Ten? Uh, probably eleven. Uh, there is an out. There is a commit outstanding right now after the Jerome Tang commit alert. We think it'll be another instant impact transfer. Um, pretty sure about that. Actually, uh, just not announced yet. And it's another guy that gives you a chance to compete next year. Love it. All right. Things moving in the right direction for a big prospect in 2023 in Day Day Ames. Things moving in the right direction with the current roster. A lot of good things happening in the world of K-State sports right now, football and basketball. And a new Big 12 commissioner. How about that? Uh, fun pod today. It's going to wrap it up for us. Once again, always appreciate 360 Vodka from Holiday Distillery. Check out their Bottle and Bond Bourbon as well. Uh, if bourbon is more your speed, but they do great work supporting us here on the podcast, and we sincerely appreciate it. For Tucker Franklin behind the scenes, for Derek Young and Cole Manbeck, I'm John Kurtz. Thanks for tuning in to the Fremont Pod today.